In this video, I want to talk a bit more about the conflict in Aceh, the GAMS struggle against the Indonesian government, and how the tsunami of Boxing Day 2004 helped end the conflict and provided increased access to natural resources by the government. However, it didn't end up alleviating some of the tensions that were there during the decades of fighting. So in Boxing Day 2004, there was this huge, uh, powerful earthquake that ended up hitting um, and crossing the entire Indian, Indian Ocean um, within minutes. It was 9.2 on the Richter scale. It triggered a tsunami that killed almost a quarter of a million people. 230,000 estimated died. The vast majority of those died in Aceh, 168,000 um, people. It's the deadliest tsunami in recorded history. Uh, of course, recorded history um, doesn't necessarily go back the, the entire age, but it was something, the scale of which we hadn't seen in at least uh, a century or uh, a few centuries. And there was also the ability to record it, similar to the videos about the tsunami that hit uh, Japan a couple of years ago from one of the earlier uh, sections. This, in 2004, of course, was uh, too early for most of my students to be able to uh, remember it, but there is just these kind of heartbreaking images of people uh, not aware what was coming their way, and then you see uh, the the waves coming at them and people running. It was something, of course, in the stories that were often told were told through Western eyes by people like these on beaches in uh, in Thailand, people on vacation. There was actually a movie with Naomi Watts and Ewan McGregor, um, uh, viscerally kind of experiencing the aftermath of it. But I think in this class, it's important to try to focus on the people who are actually affected and those kind of stories that don't often get told in these kind of widespread human disasters. This is the capital in Banda Aceh. Uh, in the aftermath of, of the tsunami, you can look at satellite photos from space and see the before and after picture, which gives you a sense of the scale and how, much, how far these waves actually reached inland and the size of the destruction that actually happened. Um, this in Indonesia, there's probably a lot more aware. In Australia, there's a lot more awareness of about Indonesian politics than uh, in the U.S. And so some of this might be recap for a lot of my students. But Aceh in Indonesia, it's in the far western part of the Indonesian archipelago. It has a little less than five million people, about two percent of Indonesia's population. Also produces about two percent of Indonesian uh, GDP. It's quite mountainous, connecting to Firon, Firon and Leighton's discussion about mountainous terrain. I know one of my students is writing an entire paper on the effect of mountainous terrain and other kinds of geographical factors that makes it hard to actually um, stamp out these kind of conflicts, but this is a quite mountainous area as the video that hopefully you watch before watching this from Journeyman Pictures in the aftermath of the tsunami shows the kind of rough uh, mountainous conditions in which a lot of the rebels and citizens uh, lived. Um, however, it also has that a mixed blessing of having natural resources discovered in, in 1971, natural gas is discovered, which can bring billions of dollars to the government and was a rallying cry for supporting the opposition movement because of the distribution of the resources weren't perceived as being adequately redistributed to the area, which kind of leads me to the Free Aceh Movement, or uh, GAM. Um, it is a ties back, like with a lot of these conflicts that we've looked at in the class, pretty much to independence, if not before, after the end of World War II, as with a lot of countries, um, Indonesia declared independence uh, after the end or towards the end of World War II. The colonial model and the 
the moral, uh, the perceived moral superiority of the colonizers was pretty much blown out of the water after World War II. I heard a bit with World War One, of course, but World War Two really put the nail in the coffin and started that huge push towards decolonization of wide swaths of the world's population. Um, so in 1949, the Dutch East Indies ceased to exist and became the Federal Republic of Indonesia under uh, under Sukarno. Um, Within a couple of years, as with a lot of these new countries, and as we've seen in the literature, these times of transition in which you have new countries created, new constitutions, new new bargaining opportunities to try to seek advantage um, by within the, a couple of years afterwards in 53, um, Dad Berich declared independent, uh, declared Aceh independence from the rest of Indonesia, and a number of um, local citizens back this rebellion. It is with a lot of these former colonizing um, countries after independence. I mean, Yugoslavia would be the prototypical example of this, that countries that are kind of made from outside after independence have to find reasons to stay together or splinter into a number of different countries like with Yugoslavia. I think in Indonesia, there was a big push to try to keep the country uh, unified. Uh, Timor-Leste would be the kind of one example of, of a, a successful kind of movement, but more the exception than the rule uh, by far. Um, so after a number of years of conflict after 1953, this, the government ceded some territorial um, autonomy to the, to the region on religious, educational, and cultural matters similar to other other areas that are that are more restive you give them some autonomy keep them within the country but devolve some kind of power and authority and say over how they govern their lives to try to keep them uh, keep them within the tent um, that that worked for a while until the 70s in 1976 the free Aceh movement was established for an independent is islamic state there's actually a couple of different um uh gams uh different fighting periods as with a number of conflicts like the uh, independence movement in southern sudan um periods of warfare and uh, truces and peace 76 through 79 there it was a very small group less than 200 um, soldiers and then 1989 a decade later for a couple of years the number of soldiers was an order of magnitude higher 200 to 750 and then um, the third period was 99 to 2005 even much more larger period and then um, the deaths uh, surprisingly were were not as dramatic as in in the 1990s uh, this, of course, this was written before the end of the war in 2005. This, uh, a lot of this information about the um, uh, the GAM here, I use from um, Michael Ross's chapter in a uh, book series by the World Bank analyzing Collier and Hoffler's model, uh, looking at specific uh, country studies. Um, and this, I really think, is a the books came out in 2005. The books weren't cheap to buy paper copies of. Now, of course, they're free as, as PDFs by the World Bank. But it was an effort by uh, Paul Collier and Nicholas Sambanis um, to try to evaluate this kind of quantitative comparative model and look at particular countries. And I think this is relevant for a lot of undergraduate students that might struggle with quantitative models and trying to understand how the theories collect, connect to the data. What this book series uh, did is it took the Collier and Hoffler model of greed versus grievance, the structural characteristics of a state that make it more likely to have conflict, and they looked at specific countries. The volumes are broken up by regions, um, but Ross, uh, who we've seen from the Natural Resource Week last week, um, looked at how Aceh was relatively poor compared to the rest of Indonesia, which connects to the, the Buha get all article from a while back, looking at how it's not just overall country development, it is how the development is distributed within a country. So this area is relatively poor compared to other parts of the country. It was mountainous, as I mentioned before, which connects to the, the Collier and Hoffler model and the Farron and Leighton model. 
it didn't it doesn't have that ethnic frag, uh, fragmentation it's relatively um, uh, homogenous compared to um, to other areas in which there was fighting but they're definitely different than uh, a number of other groups in and in, 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 as you would expect with a country with uh, with 10,000 islands there's a substantial um, Achenese uh, diaspora which can provide uh, funding and support and political influence in the other countries there's a history of conflict. As I mentioned before, you have this iterative process of groups getting slowly stronger and more uh, more able in order to fight the government and get political concessions. Highly dependent on natural resources, as I mentioned, uh, natural gas production since the 1970s. And there was democratic reform and change after uh, the long-serving um, uh autocratic leader uh, was forced to step down due to protests in 1998 after the Asian uh, financial crisis. There was financial reforms in 98 and 99. The um, Indonesia now has had four democratic presidential elections since then. I think the next one is in 2024. Um, but there have been democratic reforms within the country that would allow um, local areas like um, in Aceh to get some kind of political um, representation or perceived legitimacy of the government, which could in, in some ways kind of trace it to what ended up happening in, uh, in August of 2005. You saw in that video the extent to which people kind of saw this as a watershed moment, an opportunity to try to end the conflict and bring people together uh, in order to 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 move beyond that kind of phase for mutual um, goals. Since uh, since that agreement, as you saw with the video, there's some people who definitely seen less increases in their quality of life than they would have expected after the end of the uh, after the end of the conflict. So I mentioned back in '79 that Aceh received uh, more autonomy from the federal government. They received even more in 2001 before the end of the conflict. After the 2005 peace agreement, they were allowed to implement Sharia law in, um, in Aceh. It is a conservative uh, Muslim society, so they were given the freedom to do that in ways that uh, other parts of Indonesia do not. Um, the, the poverty returned to pre-tsunami levels in 2006. Things kind of went back to equilibrium after that shock. Um, the the armed group, um, the GAM, became uh, Party Aceh in 2007, which connects to a whole long literature on how rebel groups become political parties. Sinn Féin just won this unprecedented election in, in uh, Northern Ireland just like a week or so ago. It just shows how these kind of armed rebel groups can transform into political parties and how being brought into the political process can give them more power and and voice in in the say in their governments but can also show the difficulties in actually governing reminds me of in nepal after the end of the civil war in 2006 the former maoist leader became prime minister and um he had difficulty in actually trying to lead and to carry out a lot of the promises and policies that he said he was uh, was was going to bring in, and so you can see with the party Ache as well that they had difficulties once they actually became a political party. They won forty seven percent of the vote in the local elections in two thousand and nine, two thousand and eleven. The party split, kind of like with um, the Sudanese parties uh, from last week, where there was a new party. Um, and then the election support gradually went down. Two thousand four, the support was down in um, in to thirty five percent. We're going to talk about the election in two thousand nineteen in a, in a second. But I thought take a break from politics, look at how other things in the island have evolved. This is still a mountainous and um, often rural uh, part of the country. Just a. Uh, this I think this article is now the, from from 2020 2021. While elephants destroyed four houses in Aceh, I think a couple of tigers were just killed within the last week. Also in the region, last time I checked, it's also tried to branch out and diversify income away from from natural resources. Similar story to what we talked about last year with uh, last week 
with uh, Saudi Arabia and um, other countries to try to bring about some form of stability. One way that it kind of connects to one of my former hobbies was uh, there was a ultra marathon that was due to be held in March of 2020 uh, in um, in Aceh. I think it was it was long. It was like 125 kilometers, 250 kilometers. It was it was uh, it was going to be a long race. I ended up having to call it off because COVID, uh, and so it was end up putting on hold. But it's a way to try to bring tourists in and try to diversify the economy some of that can be hurt in some ways by news that comes out of the country uh out of the part of the country that might seem to put it at odds with a lot of the trends in in other parts of uh, the world one of the the implement the highest profile implementations of sharia law was uh, the use of corporal punishment and um, floggings which can be for a whole host of regions of reasons just this from a couple of months ago um, a woman and a man were flogged for uh, adultery the woman was flogged the maximum by law that you can be flogged there was is a hundred lashes the woman was uh, got the full 100 while the man only got 15 because he had denied it throughout the trial and so they said that they couldn't find as an equal amount of blame because he didn't admit what he did was wrong kind of shows the gender disparity with the 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 uh, punishment there's also um other cases in which um homosexuality which is also uh, uh punishable by flogging um two men i think they received um I don't think they received the full hundred, but the one thing that I took from that case was that flogging is so hard and the people who are actually doing the flogging that they had to trade out after 40 lashes. I think this woman actually didn't get, uh, she got a break um, for part of it because it was just so brutal. But you have these kind of, multi, uh, these conflicting efforts uh, trying to open up and diversify in some ways and then try to maintain traditional cultural connections and the others which could kind of go against that in some ways also a difficulty in actually trying to govern is the the last presidential election i don't know how many of you might have followed it in 2019 um this um this uh competition between um um uh widodo and prabio uh was was uh, contentious and actually i i mentioned the fact that the the party had split in 2011 the former uh rebel um rebel organization with party chairman supported um prabio while the party secretary supported widodo who ended up uh winning while the losing candidate uh, uh accused um the opposite side of widespread uh cheating one of the interesting strategic reasons potentially for um, trying to split the vote and trying to seek uh, favor um, for the potential long-term interests of the region. One was just one of the, uh, the parties was uh, one of the, uh, one of those two leaders was calling for a referendum on um, Achenese uh, independence. Um, and uh, Ranto suspected that the call for a referendum might relate to a political movement, including um, his defeat in the gubernatorial election, that you can have individual level motivations for trying to have national level policy changes because of, um, because of uh, individual experience. But it also does show with some of these separatist conflicts that you can have an ending in which you are kept within the country but have more autonomy and more uh, allocation of the resource wealth, but still doesn't serve the long-term um, interests for certain parts of the country, and there could be efforts to try to gradually grow towards a referendum. Don't know what's going to happen, and time will tell, but I think trying to connect to the the video that we watched in 2005 and then to the 2015, you can see how some people would get frustrated or have grievances against the government if they don't see their lives being made relatively better uh, compared to what the, how they were or how other people are doing within the country. And so I think 
I would be interested to see if you, for the second lecture question, if you can make any links between the causes of conflict we've read about over the course of the term and the situation in 2015, a decade after the end of the conflict, whether those kind of grievances or uh, economic um, causes might pose a risk potentially going forward. So that is a short summary of a couple of elements related to the uh, 2004 tsunami, the effect that it had on an ongoing conflict that led to peace, as well as connecting to political institutions and individual satisfaction that can tie into the theories that we've covered so far in this class. So with that, I'll take a break and then come back with the last video of today talking about how natural disasters might connect to the current COVID, uh, the COVID experience um, that we're all kind of living through and why connecting to that last puzzle for today, why that hasn't led to more conflict than um, it might otherwise be expected to given the theories that we've covered. So let's turn to that now.